I'm glad we're now looking forward to the 15th of June when church doors may be opened and people may enter to just pray individually and quietly. It's a first step. It's a first important step. I think it's important because there is something quite corporeal, quite to do with the body about the practice of the Catholic faith. It's the way we pray, it's the places in which we choose to pray, it's the fact that we build churches and we make the church an outward expression of our faith. And therefore to enter the church is again to enter in a particular sense our sacred space. And I know people are looking forward to this. Uh, here at Westminster Cathedral we've had people praying at the closed door. Often there's been a bunch of flowers left at the door of the church. There's a yearning, a longing to be in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. That's part of our deep-rootedness of faith, that we know that Jesus is present with us and he makes that present into a visible, tangible sacrament. And so we yearn to be back in the aura, in the presence so that we can express our love for him in this way, which is more fully, a more full expression of who we are. Now, we've got to do this carefully. We've got to do this properly. We've had guidance, and that will no doubt continue. But I'm confident that great care will be taken by everybody entering a church and by those responsible for the opening of churches that do it in a good way when they're ready and this will be a big step forward for us. I also think it's a big step forward for society actually. I think the image of a church door closed is quite stark. It carries its own meaning and the image of a church door wide open is also a very important message that come and enter into what we know to be the house of God and in entering and placing yourself there we know that we live in God's presence always and when that dimension of God is seemingly absent from a way of life from a society when we forget about God then the lesson is that we soon forget about each other as well we become absorbed in ourselves and in the, the limited reach of our own immediate experience. So a wide open door of a church can create a wide open heart to the reality of God, to God's living presence and to the compassion that we show for each other. In practice, it means that each church will look at the guidance and look at its capacity and I hope talk to its neighboring parishes and go step by step and open when the, those responsible for the church, the priest and his team, know that they can do this properly. It's going to be limited because we have to work out how we can offer seats for people that maintain at the moment two meters, six feet distance between one another. It should be a method that, if possible at all, we go in through one door and out through another, so we're not passing each other at the entrances. And it should be an entrance that invites, requires everybody to use a hand gel to make sure that they're not bringing in the virus and also that they don't pick it up. And it means a routine of cleaning as well at the end of the day so that you know, we do as best we can to ensure that there's no transmission of this silent, very, very deadly virus for some people and that it's safe, it's quite safe to come and pray in church again. As far as I understand the, the regulations and the change in regulations by which we can open churches on the 15th of June apply to England. I don't think they apply in Scotland or in Wales at this time. They do already apply in Northern Ireland. And I know that in Wales there have been meetings between the, the bishops and the Welsh Government over these matters too. The announcement that was made on Sunday about the opening of churches on the 15th of June was quite explicit. It said it was for individual prayer 
and it, it explicitly said that does not include the celebration of Mass with a, a public congregation present. So that has to wait, and it has to wait for all sorts of reasons, because obviously announcing a public celebration of Mass draws people together and therefore creates a group, a large group, even if it's limited to some extent. It also involves much closer physical contact, particularly in the distribution of Holy Communion. And customarily, it would involve some singing and public shared proclamation. And all of those things, we're told, have an element of a risk of the transmission of this virus. So we have to be patient and we have to cooperate with public authorities in these public health issues. That's a grave responsibility that we have. There's many things that we've learned, and there are some old treasures that we've recovered, and some practices, I think, that we've restored as part of the pattern of our life. I think, for example, many families have found this both a difficult and an enriching time. A friend of mine in Liverpool told me she was in a queue for the supermarket and there was a young family in front of her and they said, oh, come on, you come in front of us. They got talking. And the mother with two young daughters said, we're having a great time. She said, we do all the schoolwork in the morning and then in the afternoon I teach them. I teach them how to cook, I teach them how to sew, I teach them how to knit. They're darning their socks, they're repairing their clothes and every Friday then we come out and get some sweets. So she was enriching their family life through having extra time together and I know lots of people are doing that. So at its best there are lots of things that we're learning. We're learning the importance of generosity, of generosity and looking out for those in need. We're learning the importance of appreciating people who do ordinary jobs like street cleaners and lorry drivers and delivery men and people who stack the shelves in the supermarket, they're appreciated more now. So we've got a deeper appreciation of the dignity of work. There's lots of things that we mustn't lose. We mustn't lose. These different ways of reaching out, of teaching the faith, of sharing faith, of having a rosary network on the telephone, all sorts of things. These we have to keep and move into what people like to speak of as our new normal. One of the most difficult things of these months has been trying to do my job in a new way. It's almost like learning a new job because most of the ways in which I try to fulfill my responsibilities involve meeting people, involve going from parish to parish, involve working closely with a team here in Archbishop's house and all of that has had to stop and I've had to find new ways of keeping links with people, trying to share responsibility, and that's not been easy. And the fact that each day seems the same as the previous one, life has almost become monochrome, whereas normally it was polychrome, it had lots of colour in it. So that's been quite hard. I think, like everybody else, one of the things I've learned is the benefit of not rushing round the benefit of being able to stop still, the benefit of doing a bit of gardening, the benefit of having a bit more time to pray, the benefit of sitting regularly, having a routine pattern to every day, which is kept as steady. And those things too, we shouldn't just throw away, because we should keep that inner stillness, even when the speed increases again.